This is a Nexus special, episode 64, Google I.O. 2019, on Tuesday, May 7th, 2019. And now, adamant about emphasizing. This Nexus special is hosted by Ian R. Buck and Ryan Rampersad. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash ns64. All right, Ryan. So things that they talked about at Google I.O., um... I think it's really important to remember that like Google I.O. isn't their big hardware, you know, announcement time, right? So a lot of the things that they tend to talk about are more of the services like, and stuff. services systems, yeah, which I would argue is probably more important. Like those are things that are going to affect our day-to-day lives in more profound ways than like what is the latest phone that Google is releasing. Yep. Turns out there is the latest phone that they're releasing today, though. So we get we get to talk about both. <laughs> um, first thing that I I noticed um is that they like continuously throughout the entire thing they were very adamant about emphasizing that like a lot of the machine learning processing all this stuff that they're doing is like it's all on device. We're it's not, a big deal. We're not sending data back to the servers. We're doing as much of it on the device as possible. Um, which we'll definitely dive into a little bit more when we get to the part where they were talking about like privacy and security and stuff like that. Um, but that was like a theme throughout the whole presentation. Yeah, that's a big deal because in the last two years, Apple has made a big deal about it, mm-hmm. and I'm sure they will make another big deal about it this year. And of course, yesterday at Build, there was further big deals about on device in Windows and elsewhere Mm -hmm. machine learning taking place versus in the cloud all of the time yeah yeah Yeah. which is really interesting because it's like a it's a radical shift from like google's classic approach to things which is like how can we take something that is traditionally done on device and make it better by having it be cloud-based sure and i think there are i think they're still going to be doing that here and we clearly can see that they are uh, but I think there are many cases where you can do just a good enough a job so that people don't need more today yeah. on device. And that lets them get away with slower connections in parts of the world where there just are nothing. Yet. Yeah, yeah. The, the other thing that's amazing to me is that, like, when they say on device, right, we're not even talking about, like, desktops anymore. Like, this is right. stuff that's being run on really cheap phones. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, so, I... You know, like, Come to think of it, like Google Pixels. Yeah. Yeah. But like in particular, they were talking about Android Go devices, which are, you know, like start at 35 bucks or whatever that they were talking about. And I think that's one of the reasons they have to sort of promote it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing that they promoted that I was very surprised about, actually, was they mentioned podcasts. Like it was like the third thing in the keynote that they talked about was like, hey, yeah, we're we're improving the way that things are being presented in Google searches. In particular, they were like podcasts. We can index a whole bunch of podcasts and show you like, you know, information from them, not just based on their titles and and metadata that, that, you know, has been published alongside the episode, but also like they're transcribing the Mm -hmm. entire shows. Um, Hey, Google, if you're transcribing our shows and indexing all of that, can you like give me the transcription as well? Because I really want to have our shows transcribed. Yeah. Uh, but I, I can't afford to pay for that. <laughs> right. And so I think I think it's a it's a weird thing though, because you know, taking those those episodes and then deriving media from them mm-hmm. is sort of a slippery slope. So is that covered under fair use if it's not also made public? Like if it's not a direct transcription, it's more like a search index. Yeah. I think you could probably get away with that better. Um, I it, it's a it's a weird thing, and I don't know how to feel about it yet. Yeah, I mean, for for our shows, of course, they can do whatever the heck they want with it because we release all these under a Creative Commons license. So sure, yeah. but but uh, not everybody has that luxury. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, it I I am looking forward to seeing what kind of like increased emphasis google has for podcasts going forward you know because yeah. like obviously they they have started a lot of initiatives and then let it sit for too long and then it fizzles out yeah i mean i haven't been trying out the the google podcasts app for listening 
uh, just yet. So I don't, I, I haven't seen what kinds of improvements they've been making in it, you know, over time. Um, so I'll, yeah. I'll let you know when I do. <laughs> I'm not that interested in it. It doesn't matter much to me. No. Uh, one thing that I think might interest you is that they are bringing 3D models and AR objects to the knowledge graph. So the knowledge graph being the section of a Google search result that is like over off to the right yep. that has basic information about whatever sports team or phone or um, animal you are searching for, right? I've always wanted a 3D model of an armadillo. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that? No, it's not on the knowledge graph yet. <laughs> Soon, though. <laughs> yeah, that's... I mean, this is, I think one of the best uses of the like AR embedded in web pages yeah. technology that, that Google has been pushing forward recently. Mm -hmm. um, love to see that. Yeah. I think we'll, we'll, we'll get to a point where it might be useful, but it might still be a while. Yeah. It's, it's definitely getting like, I'm just going to use it to wow people for a little while. Yeah. yeah. One time. <laughs> uh, another thing is, Google Lens. So Lens, of course, has been... It's it's so weird to talk about Lens because, like, it's not an app by itself, you know? It, it's built into yeah. Google Photos. It's built into the camera. It's built into the assistant. And for people who are not running Google phones, it's sort of even further buried. It's, it's only in the assistant, and you have to go through multiple menus, basically, to get to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... They're bringing a few new things to Google Lens. Um, they were talking about menus. So you go to a restaurant, you see a menu, and if you point your camera at it, you're totally not going to look like a dork doing all this. Uh, but you point your camera at the menu, and then Lens will highlight the popular dishes uh, at this restaurant and give you like more information about them. So here's here's what I want you to hypothetically envision. Mm -hmm. So you... <laughs> You're you're really hungry and it's a Friday night and it's Perkins night. Okay. So you go to Perkins and you take out your phone and you have Google Lens and you scan the pancakes page. Okay. And of course what comes up is the over sixty five pancake special uh -huh. uh from Perkins because that's who eats at Perkins. <laughs> and so like is that actually helpful to anybody? Like most menus are gonna be pretty multiple pages. Yeah. You're not gonna just scan one page. Like how does it work? How do they know what's popular? Well, I I wonder if that comes from a lot of the Google Maps information that they've been collecting over the years. Because Maybe, like, but have people been also taking those pictures with like this was menu item X from X from Y? Yeah, a, a lot of times when I go to a restaurant and like and and happen to take a picture, and then Google's like, "Hey, do you want to upload this to Google Maps?" And then it prompts me like, "Which menu item is this?" If that's what it is, that's good, but that doesn't ask how popular it is, I guess, yet. Well, if they can tell, like, which ones more people are taking pictures of, then presumably more people are ordering that thing. That's true. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see with Google Lens. Or not. <laughs> um, Another thing, I don't think this is technically under the umbrella of Google Lens, but it's definitely related, Um, is they have built in, like, sign reading and translation to um Android Go devices, and they managed to compress all of this into less than 100 kilobytes of storage space, right. which is huge. Well, it's the opposite of huge. It's very small. <laughs> um, But yeah, this is, like, the kind of thing where... I, I think I remember I was literally in Sweden when they first ro started rolling out this like um, in in the Google Translate app where you could point your camera yeah. at a sign and like, it would overlay the yeah. translation of it on the sign. It's really nice. It's yeah. And it matches like the font on yeah, the sign and everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's it is great. It's a good feature. I so one question about this is how much can it translate? Um, like, do you have to pick a couple of languages or? Was it just popular languages? Like, how does that work? Yeah, I'm not sure which languages are supported. Um, but I think it's fine. Like, when you when you use it the first time, it'll ask, and then it'll store what it needs. Yeah, yep. probably. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, like, the, the sign reading portion of it was, like, specifically 
geared towards people who are coming online for the first time sure. and who are illiterate. And yeah. so, like, you know, a lot of the information in the world that's conveyed through signs is inaccessible to them. Right. right. Um, and so allowing the the phone to bridge that gap mm-hmm. to read it out loud to them um, will definitely improve people's lives. They mentioned something called duplex on the web, which is, I don't know, it just seemed like it was autofill, but like yeah. taking it a step further, I guess, maybe. So when I was uh, reading the, the live tweets from people, this is what was going on. And it seemed to me like this was, as you said, extreme autofill, but it also seemed like you could uh, do duplex like commands. So get me reservations from some place or mm-hmm. reserve my car from X place. And it would use the web forms that exist today mm-hmm. and try to autofill those for you. Right. To start either start or complete the process. Right. So I guess nice. that's good. Um, does that exist only in Chrome? That's Does, a good question. I, I don't know. Were they demonstrating it on on mobile devices specifically? I don't know. Is it? Yeah. I didn't see pictures, so I'm not sure. They talked about voice recognition uh, stuff. They they referred to like the the models that they've built, all the machine learning, the files and everything that it needs to do that. Um, they've managed to compress that down from like a hundred gigabytes down to half a gigabyte. So they can um, actually install all of that locally on a mobile device nowadays. Cool. Um, and so they were demo st- demonstrating <laughs> like somebody performing like almost every single task on her phone using only her voice instead of, you know, switching apps sure. and, you know, opening stuff and typing everything were in. Were they all Google apps? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay, yeah. that doesn't count. <laughs> but like, yeah, it, and and she was doing them so fast. She was going through all these commands so fast and the the phone was keeping up and I had not turned off the microphones on my Google Home devices and my Google Home devices couldn't keep up with it. They you know, they kept pausing and waiting and and you know, couldn't couldn't do all the commands that she was saying like as quickly as she was yeah. coming out with them, which was really cool. That is good. I think it was her fault that uh, I had jazz music playing in my kitchen for 10 minutes before I realized what was happening. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't remember exactly what language they used in the presentation, but like wh- the way that they said it made it sound like this feature is going to be only on new Pixel devices going forward. So mm-hmm. the Pixel 4 that's going to be releasing this fall, presumably... I think that'll be the first device that has this sure. uh, available. Not sure why, like hardware-wise, why that wouldn't be available on the Pixel 3, but... Some you know, special chip or something. Something, yeah. yeah. I certainly have half a gigabyte of storage space available for these machine learning yeah. models. <laughs> and it might be like some kind of neural net core sure. that's specialized yeah. in this kind of process. Similar to like the visual core. Yeah, but for audio or... They're on that process. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Uh, personal references is what they're calling uh, they're, this a system for like connecting the dots between all of the various things that you have in your personal data, right? Um, so think of like the knowledge graph, but made up of your own private information. Yeah. Um, this is like the notebook from Cortana. Okay. And. I always thought that was funny that they called it something with Cortana, but it makes perfect sense because you should be able to know what Google knows about you and tune it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And in particular, they were talking about using this to differentiate between like when a user is asking about going like asking for navigation to their mom's place mm-hmm. as opposed to asking for navigation to a business called mom's place. Right. Yeah, I can see how that can be confusing. <laughs> um, they also, while they were talking about Google Maps features, they mentioned some of these features that they're also bringing to Waze. So it's nice <sighs> to see that they're not abandoning that product. Yet. Yet. <laughs> I'm actually kind of amazed that they haven't. Because, You're amazed that Waze hasn't been abandoned? Yeah, yet? because like so many of the, the features that makes Waze 
unique and useful are in Google Maps now. Slowly. Yeah. Very slowly. But it's like, what 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 do people love about Waze? It's like the community, feed, like, yeah. you know, the, the aggregated uh, knowledge of all these people who are reporting like potholes and speed mostly, traps and mo- whatnot. Mostly the speed traps and the police right. cars. Yeah. Like that is in Google Maps now. Yeah. So. But nobody uses it yet. I have been. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> but not enough people. I also don't drive in a car very often, so they don't pop up that often. Yeah, so yeah. The pro- you're probably not helping that much. <laughs> uh, now we get to the part where Google was really emphasizing like privacy and control over your personal data. Um, they, I, I believe they recently rolled this feature out um, where you can set your your personal data to like automatically delete when it becomes like a certain age so like delete all of my location data that is older than three months old Mm -hmm. for example Mm -hmm. that kind of thing um and and i think it's available for some types of data but not yet for others but it's like it's like coming for almost all of the types of things that they that they gather on you yeah it's it's a hard thing to balance because i love that location feature Mm mm-hmm it's super cool to be able to say, oh, look, I went to somewhere three months ago on a Tuesday. That's fun. Um, but I also understand, like, that is totally something that Google can do bad things with. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's a weird, like, pros and cons spectrum kind of, where do I want this feature to exist and how does it how does it need to work for me? Yeah. And the, and the thing that um, Andy Anako was, was talking about uh, during the Material podcast last week was, like, also, like they they extrapolate so much, like knowledge about me based on that data. Right. When that data has been deleted, do they also delete the extrapolations that they have done? Right. Based on so that? is it a net loss for them as well? Yeah. And yeah. The answer is almost certainly no. <laughs> and I think that's one of the things that makes you that should make you suspicious about any of the features here. So even if you del- can delete your data, if the models have already been trained with it. Doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. And the answer is no. It's already too late. They are bringing incognito modes to Google Maps, Google Search, and YouTube. Um, so it'll work basically the same as like what incognito mode in Chrome does. Yep. Um, I think that's good. Yeah, and I and I think like when they mentioned that, I was like, wait a minute. I feel like incognito mode already exists in YouTube. But let me go double check that right now. Yeah, there I see in, turn on incognito in my YouTube app right here. Cool. So, mm-hmm. beta tester. I must be, I, and I didn't even know it. Yep. Ah, speaking of models, um, federated learning is. By the way, I'm really into the word federated nowadays. Uh, as everybody should be. <laughs> thanks, thanks to Mastodon, uh, but. Federated learning is their new kind of scheme for building all of these these like the 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 global models that they use for mm-hmm. everybody mm-hmm. um without having to upload your data to their servers right sure so what they do here is um your device will have you know it'll it'll gather that that global model that's been created um it'll do any learning that it needs to on your data locally on the device. And then the model that it creates based off of that, that's what gets pushed back upstream to help tweak the global model. Yep. Right. Um, and so your like the, the direct raw data never actually gets sent back to the servers. Right. Again, I think that's great. But if you delete your data anyway, but the model's already been trained, doesn't help. It doesn't matter. And the answer is probably no. Yeah, I don't know. It's yeah. And the the word federated there is sort of suspicious to me because nobody else can operate any of this. Right. Yeah. So it's not federated whatsoever. <laughs> it's well, I mean, it's it's distributed in a sense. It's but it's not open. Right. You know. And so it's 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 uh, co-located. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. 
Next up, they were highlighting a lot of the accessibility features. Um, so we, we kind of got into some of those with the like um, the sign reader uh, on Android Go devices. Um, but they, they were talking about a few other things here. Uh, live captioning was definitely the flagship feature here, um, which I believe is a it's, it's existed for a little while. So they were kind of highlighting what this has done in the world for real people. Um, live captioning is a, uh, a service where you can have your like phone listen to what's going on around you and then like display a caption mm-hmm. of you know what other people are saying. Um, which is really, really cool. Mm-hmm. Live relay is kind of like a a combination of that of of live captioning mm-hmm. with like Google Duplex, yeah, but also you're interacting with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so what live relay is is like, let's say that you receive a phone call. Let's say that you are deaf or hard of hearing, um, and so you answer the phone call, and your phone will show you a transcription of everything that the other person is saying. And then in order to respond, you can, I, I suppose you could, like, probably speak into the microphone mm-hmm. and, and you know, have a conversation that way. But by but, text. But if you can't, if you can't speak, right, or if you uh, feel awkward, like, you know, with your own voice, you can type in your responses, mm-hmm. and then the Google Assistant's voice will say that back to the other person so from their perspective they are having a conversation a little bit of a delay i imagine as you're typing yeah, right but with a robot yeah um yeah with a robot voice so um, i could even see that being useful like if you're in a meeting you mm-hmm. don't you can't talk you can't get out right now sure but you could just type your response and they'd be good to go mm-hmm. so that's nice yeah mm-hmm. so if you send an emoji uh i think that i think that like we've seen situations in it already where that kind of thing happens. Like when when I was uh, driving the other day, uh, and Android Auto like popped up with a with a notification like, mm-hmm. "Hey, somebody sent you a message," and I was and and I was like, "Okay, read it to me out loud." And it just said the OK hand <laughs> emoji, and nice. I was like, "All okay. right, <laughs> okay, I get that. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. I just wanted to do something. Yeah, yeah, yeah." Um, they also were talking about their like improving the voice dictation models that they have because like the 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 audio files that they used to train all of these models mm-hmm. right are of course made up of people who are not difficult to understand right because I mean I would imagine that it's easier to like train the models based off of that so that's mm-hmm. probably probably why they started there um but they are now uh let's see i think they call it project euphonia yes uh is their their initiative to like train a universal voice model that can understand like anybody no matter like what kinds of accents or speech impediments they might have sure. or whatever right um and so they they actually had like an open call right there on stage like hey if you are somebody who like is a little bit hard to understand when you're speaking, send us some voice files of yourself speaking so that we can use that oh, to that's interesting. help train the model. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they they were talking about like one of their engineers who literally just like sat there and like spoke into a microphone for like out like 15 hours or something like that just to train a voice model for his own voice specifically, sure. right? So that it could understand him. Um, and obviously doing that for every single person Would on the hard. planet is infeasible. Uh, so hopefully they're, they, they're going to figure out a way to have a, a voice model that can train itself on some, right. you know, a person's voice. And I think this is one of those cases where having the cloud model is very important yeah. and very useful. Um, and I, I, I hope that Google will eventually open some of that model up because it's not as if there aren't other organizations and tools that could use some of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, there are many people in the world who I can't understand and I would like to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. 
All right, so now we get to the part that I'm here for is more tra- uh, more of a traditional tech conference announcement stuff, right? Well, the hardware, k- kind of here and there. Like everybody goes to WWDC for the good old services and software, the things that make Apple stuff good. But we also all want a new MacBook Pro. We also all wanted a new Pixel phone. Mm-hmm. And what do we get? A new Pixel phone. That's right. Yeah. But it doesn't have a new number. What does it have, Ian? It's got the number three and a letter. And a letter? Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. Is it like an X? No. Is it a Z? No. Well, I don't know what letter it could be then. Start at the other end. An A. It's, it's very strange. Yeah. So, Pixel 3a, oft rumored, much leaked. So, so it, it's, it's, it's extremely rumored and extremely leaked in the last few weeks. But what's weird about this product is that we've basically known about the SKUs since last September or as early as June of 2018 in some like offhanded ways. Mm hmm. So it's sort of strange because Google could have released all four versions of the phone, all threes, so the regular three and the three A line, Mm -hmm. last year, all at the same time in October, but they didn't. They could have released this in December. They didn't. They could have released this in February. They could have released this anytime, but they chose to wait until I.O. So it seems like something got hung up. Yeah. And they just, okay, well, I.O. is coming up. Let's just do it then. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's kind of a bummer because that means we have to wait another year for the next one. Maybe. Or if they've got all their ducks in a row this time, maybe the next one. No, it won't be coming out in October. No, it would be too soon. That would be way too soon. And so in some ways, this is probably better for Google because now they can have uh, high-end phones and a low-end phone. Yeah. Um, So we'll talk about, starting now, whether these are low-end enough in terms of pricing. So these, these are Pixel 3a there are two variants, mm-hmm. a small one or a regular size one, mm-hmm. and an XL. Mm-hmm. And they begin their pricing at three ninety nine mm-hmm. for the small one and four seventy nine for the larger one. Yeah, how does that sound? Uh, that is the price point that I love the most. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good sweet spot. Um, the rumors I had been seeing were uh, four fifty and five twenty nine. So these are fifty dollars okay. cheaper, basically. Mm-hmm. I accept. Uh, what's interesting is that there is no storage options. Right. So you can't make them more expensive. Yeah. That's interesting to me. But, I mean, the storage option is exactly where I would want it to be anyway. Right. You know, 64 gigabytes. Like, that I I have... It's good enough. I have never run out of storage on a 64 gigabyte phone. Right. Exactly. And uh, so my mom is used to having sort of a mid-range phone. Mm -hmm. All of the phones she's had have had a micro SD card of some sort. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, she has a Moto G5 Plus, which has 32 gigs of onboard storage and then some some card. Yeah. Even with 64, she'll be fine. Yeah. And the pictures will get you know swapped out over time. Not a big deal. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there is one thing, one very special thing here. So what's interesting is that this phone has something that its more expensive versions yeah. don't. What is that? Got a headphone jack. I, I I don't Ian, I don't know if I could hear you. It's got a headphone jack. It has a headphone jack? Yeah. Is that like something that they use to get out of Bluetooth mode? <laughs> the hilarious thing about this is that they like the 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 order in which they were mentioning things on stage was like, yeah, it uses Bluetooth like 5.0, whatever. It supports digital audio over USB C. And it has a headphone jack. And I'm like, are you serious? Why? Ugh, this Why? Is, this is, okay, as a Pixel 3 owner, this is a huge slap in the face for me. So, so OnePlus is another phone vendor that we, mm-hmm. we like because they sort of make a approximately mid-tier, mid-range phone. Yeah. And they've moved up a little bit. A little bit. In and, the last couple of years. Prior to now, they've had headphone jacks. Mm-hmm. The new upcoming version will not have a headphone jack. Mm-hmm. Well, the... The most recent one didn't have a headphone jack either. Okay, great. Yeah. So the new version will also not have a headphone jack. And like many Google phones before now, they've been based on another phone. So, of course, we mm-hmm. know that the Nexus 5 was based on an LG G2. Mm-hmm. We know that other phones are based on other phones. In the industry where you're just trying to make a phone really quick, uh, often you'll just base it on another phone. 
it feels to me like they must have based this phone off of some model they had in some storage room and said, how do we print a ton of these really quick? Mm. Hey, this one has a headphone jack. Is that okay? And they're like, yeah, sure. It's fine. Nobody will notice. So the strategy here is very strange to me. Yeah. Like if the future is headphone jackless, why are we doing it? I don't know. I I it would have been very easy for them to like for there to be a headphone jack on the inside and then just have a case seal, that seal it that, over. Yeah, exactly. That would have made people even angrier. I'm pretty sure I've been in a car that's exactly like that where it just has a rubber cover over the like people would have drilled the headphone jack back out. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. And the warranties would be void everywhere <laughs> and then and then the solder would have expired and then you would have no way to return it. Honestly, I kind of want to live in a world where that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, but yeah, like, and of course, you know, the, they want to make this phone look really good when they're talking on stage. So they're like mentioning all these things that like, you know, that make Pixel phones great, right? It's got a great camera. They're showing off all the low lighting photos, all the, you know, like super zoom in, but like you don't lose a lot of the pixel density. Yeah. Stuff like that. Features. Um, Active Edge is there. They are going to have like software features that are Pixel exclusive, like call screening, right? Um. And so I'm sitting here going, so like, why is it four hundred dollars? Like, what? Like, why what was does the, my what why does my was the Pixel three exactly? Get? What what does my nine hundred dollar phone have that this does not? It, right? Did they take out wireless charging? Yes, that's definitely not worth a three hundred dollar price difference. No. Like, hang on, did I say three hundred dollar? That's yeah. a five hundred dollar price difference. I can it, do math. Maybe. So I I don't know what the difference between the two phones are anymore. I I I did not buy a Pixel Three product of any sort mm-hmm. uh, because at the time they were not a good offer compared to these wonderful Samsung phones I keep buying. They're just so much better. Uh, so I don't even know at the nine hundred dollar price point what the Pixel phones, other than the software and camera, mm-hmm. you're getting because the hardware isn't there otherwise, and the software is barely there otherwise. Well, I I. Do very much like the hardware on my. Pixel I know phone. you like your little tiny phone, yeah. but not everybody <laughs> likes your little tiny phone. Speaking of little tiny phone, um, we were taking a look at the the sizes, the physical sizes of the Pixel Three A's, and the smaller one is actually a, a little bit bigger. It's a it's a, it's a it's a noticeable step up in terms of size from the the Pixel Three. Um, so we'll compare in a couple of weeks physically. Yeah, yeah, and I. I can tell you already that that's that's something that I would not be happy with with the Pixel 3a. You know, it it occurs to me, why did I just buy that from Google? Why didn't I just go to Best Buy? I don't understand what I do. Doesn't matter. There, uh, there are a lot more to, like ways for people to buy the Pixel 3a now. Yeah, they are increasing. They've got more carrier partnerships. Um, so pretty much all of them except the blue one. AT and T. Yes, that's the blue one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Verizon, T Mobile, Sprint, U.S. Cellular, and Google Fi um, <laughs> are are carrying the Pixel 3a in an official capacity. It'll be appearing in all of the carrier stores and everything. Which is, um, I mean, it's good in the sense that this is going to put the phone in front of more people. I'm I'm convinced that there's like two main reasons that the Pixel 3 did not sell very well. It was it's too expensive yep. and it's not in physical stores. Enough physical stores. Yeah. It's at Best Buy, of course. Okay, yep. Yeah. But mm-hmm. you couldn't buy it unlocked. That's weird. That That's is. very weird. Oh yeah. Um, That's why I didn't go to Best Buy. <laughs> but yeah, like the only reason that I'm that I'm not super bummed about this is that I got my Pixel 3 for free. So like sure. I don't yeah. I I I am excited to see what Google will do for the fall line of Pixel 4 phones, mm-hmm. assuming it happens. Um, because if it doesn't, that's going to even be more ominous. So you're only making mid-range phones now? What does that mean? Oh, that can't be the... Yeah, no, that would be insane. Yeah, <laughs> that would be very strange. Um, so yeah, I think this is good. Yeah, As, especially since like Google not only has to worry about like from a hardware division perspective, like covering the umbrella of different mm-hmm. price points, but also like from since they are a a carrier, right? Like sort of making sure and and they and it's a they they operate a service that has relatively few phones th- that are like fully fully supported on it, right? right. Having 
another first party device at That's that good. mid range is essential for that service. Yeah. They should buy essential. <laughs> well, essentially, ain't selling any products right now, so like, why not? So let's talk about the next version of Android. Take it away. It's called Android Q. Mm-hmm. The beta has been out for a while now, and uh, I heard there are some good things. Yeah. And by the way, have you looked at the logo for Android Q? Is it a Q? It's very clever. Is it's it a, a ten and a Q? Uh huh. Yeah. 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 I did look at that, and it's pretty clever. Yeah, I love yeah. it. <laughs> and and you know, everybody wants to out apple apple and so if there's a 10 in their their lineup they have to somebody else has to add a 10 to their lineup sure except that in this case it actually makes sense like android they didn't skip the number nine yeah but they were also on jelly bean for 10 years so i don't know okay so what do we begin with well the thing that i'm most excited about uh, which is kind of sad is that there's a dark theme coming in android specifically a universal non-restricted dark theme yeah yeah, yeah. i'm oh it's it's about time. This is gonna be great. Mm-hmm. Now, we'll see if all of the apps actually make it. If the apps, presumably, if apps don't implement the swap of colors, mm-hmm. it won't matter. So, if Facebook doesn't implement dark mode. Mm-hmm. Will it just be white all the time? I don't know. So, if apps don't pick it up, then maybe it won't matter so much. Right, but I mean, like, on the flip side, currently. I use a lot of apps that have dark themes, you know, yes, implemented at the app level. And then I pull down my notification drawer and I'm like, there's so much brightness here and I can't do anything about it. Yes, I, I experienced that as well. <laughs> um, the Another reason I'm really excited about this is that, like, the way that it has been implemented in the beta is that it was, like, tied to the battery, battery saver yeah. mode. And I'm so happy that it's not. You can just turn it on and not lose out on all of, like, the high um, high battery, like... Right. Uh, Animations. Yeah. Um, location tracking. At, yeah, all that stuff. Yep. Uh, foldable phone support. Yeah. Apparently, foldable phones are coming. And, um, yeah, and Android so is supporting they, them. And they came, and then they were returned. <laughs> um yeah, I don't know if I'm that excited about that. So one of the things that they talked about in the... Or that I noticed in the animation when they were showing off, like, foldable phone stuff was, like, okay, you've got this this app that is that you're using on the small screen, and then you open it up and you, you know, see it on the big screen. And, like, the, the little line drawing that they had of the app was very nicely like laid out with multiple columns mm-hmm. to you know you could ha- you had like a menu off to the side and everything and I was like oh are we going back to the days where we encourage app developers to like actually make apps that have like different layouts for different sized screens we are not encouraging that would that. be really nice Google if you actually did that yourselves as well in your first party apps no that's not gonna happen I know but like left man yeah if 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 using miniature tablets wasn't enough of an encouragement for like developers to do that will foldable phones be enough of an encouragement for them to do that i doubt it i doubt it because i don't know if the penetration of foldable phones will be in any way high enough for it to matter anytime soon right yeah, yeah. tablets certainly weren't high enough penetration because like apple's got that on lockdown on the ipad no, right nobody buys android tablets nobody buys them and nobody buys them because there are none and there are mm-hmm. none because nobody buys them <laughs> so it's a cycle that google could have broken and they had time to do that but they decided to not yeah do i mean it. it's not for want of trying they've they've come out with they came out with expensive tablets but everybody wanted cheap tablets and they didn't keep coming up with those i mean the nexus 7s were pretty cheap yeah those were good but then yeah. the one after that the nexus 9 was a tablet full of fire <laughs> And then the one after that was no. A, that's Amazon's tablets. <laughs> sure. Uh, and then the the what the Pixel C something like that. Something like that. Yeah. I have no idea what product category that was supposed to be in, but a tablet was not it. And then there's the Pixel Slate, which isn't even Android technically. So yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if uh, anything will come of that. It's good for support, but again, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, speaking, speaking of, of not support. mattering. <laughs> wow we have different perspectives here <laughs> speaking of not mattering 5g native support's coming along yeah yeah great okay we'll call back in two years sure uh privacy and permission controls this is important yeah so the thing that i was most 
excited about here was that like y- you will be able to set location permission to be only when app is in use. Very important. Which is yeah, like that's a that's a level of granularity that iOS has offered for a very very long time. So I will make one amendment to that. Yeah. In one of the previous uh, pre-releases of iOS that has since come out, there was a feature where the location would only be a lot. It would only be allowed if the app was open or in use. Yeah. But it also showed that visually with a big annoying orange or red bar up on top. Yeah. And I loved that because it gave users agency to know that a specific app was spying on them. Mm -hmm. And then they took that out before the beta term was over. Oh. And that was very sad. So it still only allowed it when it was in the foreground or, you know, in the active background, Mm -hmm. but wasn't as good. Right. Um, and Android is is bringing more reminders for like for the the user to know when their location is being accessed yeah. by particular apps. Um, I'm sure that like the the UI design of this is going to change a few times before we see it in the final release. Yeah. Um. So I, I don't know. It it might show up as like a persistent notification type thing. It might show up as just like an icon in that in the title bar. Yep. Who knows. I uh, I'm a big fan of this kind of thing because it's really overlooked. Like people will just hit yes, 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 yes when you get permissions. Oh, yeah. being asked, and it'd be nice if you could also say kind of. Yeah. Um. But if it's if it's um, if nobody knows that something's using your permission, then it's not good enough that it's just um, only when app is in use. Mm-hmm. It, you have to always be able to know. Yeah. Focus mode. Ironically, I was not focusing on the presentation that closely when they were talking about focus mode. So I don't remember exactly what things it turns off, but um, I believe it's, you know, the kind of thing where it will turn off like notifications and, you know, visual indications that there are notifications and stuff like that, right? So that you can get stuff done yeah. uh, when you need to. The. You can pick a list of apps, yeah, and then basically, if you go into focus mode, you can ignore them yeah. for a long time. Yeah. So it, 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 uh, there's also a setting that if it has the word Reddit in it, it goes away. No, that's not a real setting. <laughs> Should be. The I I like that they are making an attempt with this, but the way that I have my life set up is definitely not going to work for me. No, because like you know, even like I I already have ways to like you know make sure that my notifications don't show up or anything. My watch doesn't follow those rules, right? Because my watch is outside of the the Android, the direct Android ecosystem. It, yeah, it will buzz and tell me that there's a notification, even when my phone will not. So um, I guess that's like and and like push bullet will like po- pop up with a notification on my computer like when my phone you know so like i have so many different things that i would have to remember to turn off anyway yeah it's, so yeah. i guess that's an extension of the google and x category syndrome mm-hmm. so they couldn't figure out tablets they can't figure out smart watches and so there's a bunch of low hanging fruit that they aren't going to solve because they're just not interested mm. it's great <laughs> But also, I mean, like, I do I do like being able to turn these things on and off individually, like, separately, you know? Sure. Um, they can make a couple of switches for that. It just means that I have to remember to go to all of the different places where all of these things are. So, it, really, I'm just laying in the bed that I've made for myself. Kind of. Yeah. Uh, parental controls are being rolled into digital well-being. I don't have children. I didn't pay attention to that. It's fine. It's great. Yeah. Cool. Gesture navigation tweaks. Um. So this is uh. Yeah. You you know how. You you on some phones you can have like instead of a home button and a recent button and a back button you can have just like a home button and a back button and kind then a of. blank space yeah. and then you like swipe left to right. To, it looks weird. It's yeah. It's no good. Um, it's, <laughs> and is that what we all concluded now? I don't know. I mean, I like it's 95% as good as like the all buttons way, but I, as a pixel three user do not have the option to choose which one I want to use. Mm. So it's terrible. Um, 
like there's there's been some leaks some rumors that like they're gonna be having like just an entire like a thin little bar at the bottom that looks very very similar to what the iphone 10 and 10s have good um i'm not sure what the gestures are going to be that are associated with that kind of thing um but i did notice on one of the demo like screens that they were showing that that like like they did not talk about this directly but i noticed it it was there up on a screen um this this new style of of the home row yeah so on on my samsung phones that are superior in every way um <laughs> you got to stop saying that no nope, cuz it's true no nope. uh so i have the normal you know traditional android mm-hmm. you know triangle circle square setup yeah which i love because it's self describing like oh look that arrow does something what do you think an arrow does it goes back like a browser back button cool what does a square do it shows you a bunch of squares does a circle do? I have no idea. Um, I love how this works. I think it's great. What I have seen from from Samsung is there is a mode on here which I don't have on. Instead of having the pill and then the back button that's available sometimes, mm-hmm. there are instead three little really shallow zones down here. Okay. They're, they're like imagine a, a one of these tiles just pushed down to the very bottom in each region and you just pull them up to do whatever the action is. Oh, interesting. I can show you later. Okay. It's uh, an alternative implementation. That's mm-hmm. kind of okay. I don't use it cause I like to just see the book. Yeah. Apex. They did not name this by name on stage, but um, Apex is a system that's coming uh, with the new version of Android that will allow Google to update lower level Android components without having to do a full OTA update. So the device doesn't have to restart. Um, I mean, th- think about the way that like a lot of. But thi- do I still need to rely on my carrier to get it? They said that they were. Part like working very closely with their partners. Okay, so then we're still screwed. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't matter. Just, (laughs) just we'll move on. It's great. Good try, Google. Come again. Okay. Uh, Android Q Beta three is available. Yep. On a whopping twenty three devices. That is amazing. That's a lot more. I don't even know how many devices that like where are what are those. They had a list up. Some of those must not be Google devices. Oh yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's good. Yeah, and it's a larger list than last year. Like, good, very yeah. good. How about a uh, Galaxy S10 Plus? Is that on the list by any chance? I don't know. Go um, on no, look. it's not. It's... If it were, it'd be on, on this phone already. Oh, I almost forgot about the notification tweaks. Um, so they're going to have like smart notification buttons and smart replies directly in the uh, in in the notifications. Um, I, I'm in particular, I'm like excited about the smart notification buttons. Mm-hmm. So like if somebody sends me a link, I don't have to open the notification, go into the app and yeah, you just click on, open Hey, link. open, open this in Chrome. Yeah. yeah. That's nice. There are a few things that we are expecting to come in Android Q that they didn't talk about. Like, um, but we've seen it. Yeah, but we've seen them. So hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully those are coming. Great. Another thing that they didn't talk about during the keynote that I was really hoping to hear more about was Stadia, right? So they mm. announced Stadia back at uh, the game, yeah, the game developers conference. We did not do a Nexus special of it back then. Yeah, um, that's because it's all vaporware. <laughs> I mean, in the sense that you do not have to install this wear on your own device. It's also yes. in the sense that it doesn't exist yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean. Almost all the things that we talk about on Nexus specials are things that don't exist yet. I mean, the phone exists. It's in my yeah, card. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's being shipped to you right now as we speak. Yeah. In theory. In it from an Amazon warehouse. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the big thing like that they have not talked about with Stadia that I was really hoping to find out more about is like, what what is the monetization model going to look like? Right, right. So it like, are the, is it going to be... Can I, can I pay a monthly subscription to get like access to basically all of the games that are available on Stadia? Like that would be a very compelling business model. Especially since like one of their goals is 
for you to just be able to like, oh, somebody sends me a link and like I can click on it and then, oh, I'm in the game. Yep. Um, that kind of thing is only going to be really possible if there's zero friction between clicking on the link and right. being in the game. Right. Well, and if if there's, I don't know, like before the show started, we uh, Ian and I had a really great discussion on how insane Google Pay is. Sure. With how it's monetary sending and receiving works. If if it's that hard to send money to and from an account that Google manages, it I feel like it won't be very easy either for Stadia integration to work either. Like if you're trying to play a game that you've never played before because you're just watching it on YouTube, you should basically be able to buy it instantly. And presumably you would be able to do that if you just had funds in an account mm-hmm. or could put funds into an account. So I don't know. I think there's a lot of pieces that we just don't know. Yeah. So until then, it's vaporware. Yeah, sure. <laughs> How was this Google I.O.? Uh, I, I'm really excited about a lot of the, like... Service level. The service level things, yeah, that they're, that they're talking about. Because, um, like, yeah, it, like the, the thing that gets me the most excited about technology is, like, all the ways that it can be used to improve our everyday lives. And so this is, like, a huge, huge part of that. Um it's not nearly as sexy to like you know it's it's not going to grab as many headlines until until somebody makes a fuss about all of like the privacy implications of it right which are could be either good or bad we just don't know yet yeah yeah <laughs> we will see but yeah i i uh am very excited to see a lot of the stuff that they're talking about here um available to you know for me to play with and and experience in my life yep So, Ryan, where can people find you on the internet? Well, in about two weeks, you can find me here reviewing a phone that will be called the Pixel 3a. And by here, you mean on Second Opinion, not on Nexus Special. Here on the Nexus. Sure, yes. And of course, you can find me on Twitter at Ryan Amar, and of course, you can find me at RyanRapperset.com, where I still hold, even today, a Nexus 4. Yeah. Oh, man. I love that. I love, like... Timeless. <laughs> Especially when, like, my students... Uh, discover, you know, like the in the metadata of the dog napping photos, right? Like, oh, this was taken with a Nexus 6, and then they like see a photo of you, and they're like, he's holding a Nexus phone, and I'm like, it's not the same. Okay. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> but tell him it is. It's okay. <laughs> Fine. Yep. Uh, I'm Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. Um, and, I don't know, in theory, sometime, IanRBuck.com will be a useful website. Yeah. Coming summer of some sometime sometime this has been a nexus special which is released under a creative commons attribution license so feel free to use any part of this episode as you see fit as long as you link back to the original page which is the nexus.tv slash ns64 uh, if you would like to discuss these uh, recent happenings the uh, this this big event with other listeners please go to our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash the nexus tv and uh, if you are willing and able to support us financially as we continue to make tech focused podcasts please see our patreon at patreon.com slash the nexus tv until next time have a good one have a good one the Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.